Oh, Thank great. you for coming. Yeah, yeah so yeah. great to meet you. Um, yeah, I feel really lucky. <laughs> so Aaron was telling me today that a lot of people were very inspired to, oh, really? um, to sign the petition. Are you Texas serious? Last night, so I, I brought an extra um, Oh my gosh, that makes me night. feel good. <laughs> yeah, they said people were really excited about it. Really? Thank you, yeah. Oh my gosh. Because I didn't even really get into all the other stuff that it's good for, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> but, um, it's, um, I think it's a really, one of the coolest things, you know, I mean, I worked for the Park Service and they're very cool. Mm -hmm. Forests are cool. But there's something about that, that legislation that to me, with all of this emphasis on the partnerships and stuff, it's really cool. It's cool. It's cool. We find... Let's see, we partnered with the music school here. Oh, wow. Or something, and they were sort of like trying to pull stuff out of us, and I was sitting there with Will, who he might have, might have met. I'm not sure I if didn't he meet Will. He's got no. little kids, so it's hard for him to stay late. Um, and we started sort of like riffing off of how poetic some of the legislation can be for wilderness and, and water. And um, we just love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it's true. Well, so I'll talk a little bit about th these two brothers that we owe. Um, a, a lot of the language came from some writing that they did, and it's very cool. It's actually in the law now, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I just touched on it, but it's to me, it's really neat. That, um, yeah. So, but anyway. Cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. Where do you, where are you based? Fort Collins. Okay. And yeah. So this is my friend Allison. She came up with me. So oh, nice. we skied together and Fun. yeah, yeah. It was uh, kind of a nice day. We had a great. Time. We had a great day. Good. Yeah. It was. It wasn't too cold. The snow was. You know. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So it was good. Great. Yeah. It's not been um, the greatest snow yeah. here, but um, I did a little uphilling today. Oh, you did? Wow. Um, actually, today I did it. I'm going to get some hot water. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Preserving the Dark Night with Ann Driggers and Martha Ferguson. Another talk we have coming up in two weeks is our next Naturalist Night, and it's titled The Identified Flight Technology, Protecting Sensitive Bird Species from Wind Turbine Collisions. 
And now I'm very excited to introduce tonight's speaker, Jennifer Back. As a naturalist at ACES, I've spent a lot of time learning and talking about water systems in the West, and I'm also a very passionate outdoor enthusiast and have been lucky enough to spend time on the Green River in Utah, a magical river that flows through some canyons. Jennifer also loves rivers and has dedicated herself to the conservation of these wild spaces. Jennifer retired from the National Park Service in 2021 after working for 21 years as a hydrologist in the Water Resources Division. She was responsible for developing policy, legal, and technical strategies to protect water and water-dependent resources of wild and scenic rivers. In her free time, Jennifer enjoys biking, skiing, and hiking with her husband. And tonight, Jennifer is here to share how these free-flowing rivers provide essential habitat for aquatic species in a changing world. So welcome, Jennifer. And please remember to hold your questions until the end, where we'll have a brief Q&A session. Alrighty, please welcome Jennifer back. So thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. This is a really special place to be. And so I'm so thankful to be invited to, to come here. And I'm thankful that you all guys, you guys all came out um, to hear this. Wild and, and scenic rivers are really special to me. I think it's really a very cool thing. I worked for the Park Service. And this is not just a Park Service thing. This is um, a national system of rivers. And um, it's, it's very cool. So I'm glad to be here. So the title of my talk is Born to be Wild, the Ecological Benefits of Wild and Scenic Rivers. They have a lot of benefits, but let's talk tonight about the ecological benefits. And this title comes from the idea that all rivers are born to be wild, um, but very few of them remain that way today. And it's because of all kinds of different things that go on that we use rivers for, we need the water for, um, but dams, um, uh, channelization, levees, those kinds of things, can fragment a river and, and affect its uh, ecology. And so tonight we're gonna talk about a group of rivers, a collection of rivers that are special, that still have some of those characteristics of, of wild rivers and support different ecological values. So let's get started. So I plan to give you some, a, an introduction to the wild and scenic rivers and the system um, for those of you that are not familiar with them. And then we'll get into the ecological benefits. And, and um, I want to share with you um, some examples of, of rivers throughout the country that um, provide different uh, values and benefits. Um, and then I'll have a few remarks about um, the role of wild and scenic rivers in river conservation um, near the end. So, so the national system of wild and scenic rivers, is, is a, it's a national system. There's rivers all over the countries. Currently, there are 228 designated rivers, or I should say river segments, because they rarely uh, are the entire length of a river. But um, they're in 40 different states and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Um, they're managed by one of four federal agencies, the Bureau of Land Management, the US Forest Service, the National Park Service, who I worked with, and um, the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and currently there's a, about a little bit less than 14,000 miles of river um, protected in the system, uh, which is really just a small fraction of, of the rivers overall in, in the US. So the National Wild and Scenic River System came about largely because of dams. And um, what I'm showing you here are uh, a couple of graphs, the one on the top is showing the cumulative number of dams that were built in the US um, in the last 100 years or so, or I guess it's actually a little bit longer than that. But, um, and then underneath that is the number of dams built annually. And you can see that um, sometime around 1950 in the US, we really ramped up our dam development. But um, there's an, uh, what we call the era of big dam building, which was in the mid 1900s. Um, and that's when a lot of our really large dams were being built. They were being built for various purposes, navigation, flood control, hydropower, irrigation, water supply, and other purposes. Um, they came about largely uh, in around the 1930s when um, Hoover Dam was built. 
um, in response to the, the depression. And we were trying to get people back to work. And water resource projects, not just dams, but other um, big projects were being built at that time. So there's currently about 90,000 dams in the US. These are big dams. Um, medium or big, large size dams in the US. And they impound more than 600,000 miles of river. So I, I mentioned the Hoover Dam, uh, completed in 1933. That dam is 726 feet high. Um, at the time it was built, it was the largest dam in the world. It um, no longer has that um, status. But um, Hoover Dam built in 1933. The Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia River built um, around the same time. It completed a few years later. Um, Fort Peck Dam on the Missouri River completed uh, several years later. At its widest point, Fort Peck Dam is three and a half miles wide. So you can imagine the amount of water that's being held back um, by that dam. And then finally, this dam, Oroville Dam, is currently the largest dam <coughs> in California, in, in the US. It's in California on the Feather River, which happens to be a wild and scenic river above this dam. So today we know that dams you know, have a lot of negative um, effects. We didn't really look at those effects during that, that period of large dam building. That wasn't something that we were thinking about. Um, the, the Environmental Protection Agency wasn't around um, until the 70s. And so we weren't doing these, um, you know, really looking at it, uh, the environmental impacts. But today we know that they cause various things, habitat fragmentation, loss of bio biodiversity and native species, um, disruption of natural flow, not just of water, but sediment, um, and degradation of water quality. There's some concerns about the water quality in uh, reservoirs above dams, but also the water that's being released. Um, and a big thing is they impede fish migration, so that fish that need to go back up and down a river, um, of course, a dam is a really <coughs> big deal for them. So, and they destroy um, critical habitat as well. So the idea for the National Wild and Scenic River System was conceived in Montana. Um, it is really largely due to these two brothers, Frank and John Craighead. We owe a lot to them. They, are twin, they were twin brothers. Um, they were wildlife bio biologists, um, mostly working on uh, grizzly bears in, in, um, in Glacier National Park. And they, at the time, uh, this was in the 1950s, were fighting a dam called the Spruce Park Dam. And it was pr proposed on the uh, middle fork of the Flathead River, uh, which is just south of Glacier National Park. Um, and that dam, uh, was I think it was going to be about 400 feet high. Um, but the thing was that the, the south fork already had a dam. Now there was this proposal on the middle fork. And there were also rumblings of a dam on the North Fork of the Flathead. And so they were very concerned about this. And they recognized that um, we needed a more comprehensive way of looking at our rivers and evaluating them and being able to say whether they had other uses other than building a dam. So they wanted to be more proactive about protecting rivers. Um, and so they really uh, were really important in, in the early days of the Wild and Scenic River System. So in the 19, late 1950s, um, I think it was John Craighead. I might be wrong. It might have been his brother, Frank. But, but he wrote an article in the um, Montana Game and Fish Department uh, publication. And he talked about the need for this national system. Um, he was really focused on wild rivers at the time. But um, he felt like um, we could protect wilderness. We could protect. Um, wild areas, but if we, we also needed to protect um, our rivers. And so um, he wrote that article, article in 1957. It was 11 years later that the act was finally signed. Um, it took a lot of effort to bring people together to um, you know, actually a, a agree to what was in the act. But um, Lyndon B. Johnson, writing um, at the time when he, when he signed the act, said, we're establishing a national wild and scenic river system which will complement our river development with a policy to preserve sections of selected rivers in their free-flowing conditions and to protect their water quality and other vital conservation values. 
So he acknowledged that there were multiple uses of rivers, but we needed to also have some rivers that were set aside to be protected. So the 1968 Wild and Scenic Rivers Act says, it's hereby declared to be the policy of the US. We're going to set aside certain rivers with their immediate environments where they possess outstandingly remarkable values, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. But these rivers shall be preserved in free-flowing condition, and that they and their immediate environment shall be protected for the benefit and enjoyment of future generations. So this idea of free-flowing condition is really um, fundamental to the wild and scenic river system. And there's three, th three things that every wild and scenic river has to have. It has to have free-flowing condition, uh, a good water quality or ability to um, improve water quality, and I'll talk a little more about that, but also these outstanding re remarkable values. But free-flowing condition, this was the first time we really saw this kind of language in any legislation anywhere in the world. Um, and what it said uh, is that a free-flowing river is flowing in natural condition without impoundment, diversion, straightening, rip-wrapping, or other modification of the waterway. Now, this doesn't mean that our wild and scenic rivers can't have some of these things on them. And we do have rivers that have rip-wrap. We have rivers that um, have some diversions on them, those kinds of things. But the idea is that so long as the um, function of a free-flowing river is still preserved um, with the, this, the processes and, and the flows that are going on, then it can um, meet that criteria of being a free-flowing river. So, so I said free-flowing condition is a fundamental value. Water quality is a fundamental value. Um, remember that in the 1960s was a time when we were really becoming aware of uh, water pollution issues. Um, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson came out and she was warning about um, DDT. Um, also, um, the, the fires on the Cuyahoga River, there wasn't, there wasn't one, there were many, um, and they were largely due to um, industrial waste just being dumped into a river. So, you know, there was this growing awareness that water quality was an issue, and these rivers um, have language in them that, that protects their water quality. And what it says is basically that uh, together, river managers, states, and the EPA are required to work cooperatively to eliminate pollution. It says um, states who are the water quality regulatory agencies, they're the ones that regulate water quality, are required to provide wild and scenic rivers with the strongest level of protection from water pollution. And so when they develop standards for a water body, they're supposed to um, you know, give the highest standards to, to rivers that are designated. Um, and then finally, there's this language that talks about not just protecting what's there, but enhancing what's there. So if there's the ability to improve water quality, even if it's meeting standards, then that should also be a goal of management. And then there's these outstandingly remarkable values. <clears throat> not uh, off-road vehicles. Um, we call them ORVs all the time, and I know uh, people that aren't as familiar might get a little confused by that, but these are um, the special qualities of a river. And every wild and scenic river has to have at least one of these that's truly remarkable for, for that um, area or region. Um, in the early days, they were generally history and culture, scenery, fish and wildlife, recreation, and geology. But we're starting to see uh, uh, a lot more um, qualities or uh, values being um, identified as, as um, ORVs. So it can be ecology, it can be hydrology, it can be botany. Um, there's a lot of different things that we now see as ORVs. So the main purpose, just to review, the main purpose of the act was to preserve free-flowing condition protect and enhance water quality, and the, to protect those outstanding rem remarkable values of, of the river and its immediate environments. <clears throat> so let's talk about the ec ecological benefits of wild and scenic rivers. There's seven things up here, but um, the first three are really, really what I want to talk about the most. Um, 
there are these physical processes that really shape the other things that I'll be talking about tonight. But so there's seven things, flow regime, hydrologic connectivity, river complexity, biodiversity, riparian buffers, refugia, and resilience. So we'll talk a little bit about each of those and the role that wild and scenic rivers have um, in supporting these values. So one of the most important things about a free-flowing river is this idea of a natural flow regime. And this doesn't mean that the river has um, uh, all of its flow, um, but there's functional components of flow that are really important to um, ecosystems. So the natural flow regime is the uh, idea that the ecological integrity of river ecosystems depends on a river's natural variability of stream flow, which means the patterns of flow that you see in a river, high flows and low flows, they both serve a purpose when we're talking about ecosystems. And the natural flow regime drives a range of physical and biolog biological processes that shape the river channel, what it looks like, um, influence water quality and nutrient cycling, um, and sustain native biodiversity. So when we talk about the natural flow regime, um, ecologists often call it a master variable because it has such a strong uh, uh, controlling and regulating effect on other processes that are going on in the river. And so what is the natural flow regime? What does that mean? Um, well, there's really just um, five things to think about um, when you're thinking about the flow regime. And those are the magnitude, frequency, duration, rate of change, and timing of stream flow. And all of those things have um, some importance to the ecological integrity of rivers. Um, an example that I like to use is the idea of um, cottonwood trees that grow alongside rivers. And they have evolved over time to release their seeds just after peak stream flow has come along and scoured sandbars and made these, so these um, areas along the river uh, cleared of other uh, vegetation um, and moist. And so the seedlings or the seeds fall on the, the moist um, sandbars and they can, um, they're, they're moist so they can grow. And um, another flood is presumably not going to come along because it's after the period of peak flow. So, um, so different species are tied to different environmental processes and cues that we see in, in the river. Um, water quality, food and energy sources, again, the channel shape and pattern, um, and the assemblages of aquatic organisms depend on components of stream flow. And so um, that's the point I was gonna make um, about um, how different species respond to environmental cues. Another example are um, salmon, for example. They uh, start to migrate um, and spawn based on flow conditions and temperature of the water. So they're tied to these different environmental cues that are going on in the, in the river. Um, the, the second thing I wanted to talk about is hydrologic connectivity. And this is the idea that um, rivers flow or, or rivers have movement, movement along four different dimensions. Um, lateral is pretty easy to think about. A river might migrate back and forth across its floodplain. Um, longitudinal has to do with the idea of, of flow moving downstream generally, but think also about organisms that need to go back upstream like fish. Um, so it is this upstream downstream continuity or connectivity. A vertical, uh, the vertical dimension is um, interactions between the bed of the channel and the, and the shallow groundwater underneath. And so there's a lot of um, cycling and, and biogeochemical activity that's going on there. So that's really important as well. And then finally, time is the fourth dimension, just the idea that um, there's this seasonal and annual variability in flows. And we don't want to interrupt that. So hydrologic connectivity allows migra migratory fish passage, links terrestrial and aquatic environments, transports water, sediment, organic material, and nutrients, uh, promotes biogeochemical cycling, and then maintains a sediment balance and sustains aquatic organisms. 
And then the third physical process that I wanted to talk about was geomorphic complexity. And what this has to do with um, is really the spatial heterogeneity of a river. So in this picture, we're looking at the Mackenzie River in Oregon. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the river, right? There's rocks and, and um, logs and, and things like that in the river. Think, compare that to a canal that might be concrete lined. It might have um, a uniform slope. It might have uniform um, uh, sides or um, channel margins. Um, so that's very different than what we're seeing here. And so that's what we mean um, by geomorphic complexity. And um, there's a saying now, comes from a woman here in, in Colorado, a messy river is a healthy river. So that's a simple way of, of thinking about it. Um, geomorphic complexity influences habitat abundance and diversity, promotes retention of water, sediment, and nutrients in the little spaces behind a, a log or behind a, a rock. Um, even those little spaces uh, where the velocity of the water might be a little bit less, um, you know, li living organisms can find a way um, to live in those places. So um, it, it um, is a, is a ha small, very small perhaps habitat, but um, something for, pe for uh, organisms to, to uh, thrive in. Um, it also increases resilience to natural and human disturbances. So a river that has complexity like this is better able to adjust um, to uh, uh, short-term disturbances that might occur. So when we talk about geomorphic complexity, we dive into it a little bit more, it has to do with this idea of different sediment sizes in the river. So um, clay, silt, uh, gravel, cobbles, and then boulders. Um, so it, that's one way of, of describing complexity. We also can think about longitudinal profile. When you look at a river, um, very rarely is it one smooth slope. It has steps and pools and riffles. All of those things are adding complexity to the river. Um, the cross-sectional shape of a river is important as well. The idea that some rivers are V-shaped, they're carving through a narrow canyon. Um, you might have a U-shaped river. Um, and then there's these rivers that are broad and shallow and meandering across a floodplain. So there's all these different kinds of um, cross-sectional views of a river. And then there's the, the bird's eye view, the plan form of a river, which has to do with, um, again, the meandering, the braidedness of a channel, um, and uh, maybe there's different, uh, there's backwater or that kind of thing. So the plan form of a channel also contributes to geomorphic <laughs> complexity. And finally, this idea of in-stream wood. Um, there, we're, we're realizing, um, we, we have realized, I guess, um, the, the effects of, of wood on habitat. It's really important um, for uh, organisms, not just, as I said before, um, providing sort of habitat in the river behind that, behind that or in the, in the areas that have less velocity, but also organisms are, are breaking it down. And so um, some of that um, material gets uh, cycled or, or, or broken down and becomes um, food or energy for, for other organisms. So um, there is really some great uh, work that's been done on the importance of having wood in the river for ecological values. So all of those things, the, the free-flowing condition of a river, the hydrologic connectivity of a river, and the geomorphic complexity all contribute to biodiversity. And so this is sort of um, a, an idealized view of a river. It's taken from, from rivers in Montana, but it's the idea that um, you have all of these different things happening along what's considered a fairly healthy river system. We have microbes processing organic matter in the bed of the river, um, and in, invertebrates or insects living in the interstitial spaces in the river. We have fish feeding on those insects and then spawning and migrating. Um, groundwater is um, coming up and um, actually moderating water temperature. It's very important um, during the summer months um, to provide small areas for fish to go to um, on occasion when, when uh, the flows are low and that kind of thing. Um, birds feed on insects and nest in the riparian habit habitat along a river. Amphibians live in backwaters. 
riparian vegetation grows on those fresh surfaces that have been um, made available by um, the scouring processes of the river. And then ungulates feed on that aquatic vegetation. And finally, predators hunt and den in those river corridors. So all of these processes are supporting um, different um, uh, individual species, but also this whole interactive um, complexity of um, different species uh, in a, in a, living in an area, an ecosystem. So, and, and so thinking about that, um, riparian areas are really important for, for habitat. Um, they represent the, the transitional zone between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. So they're the areas along the margins of the river that are wet sometimes and sometimes dry. Um, but they're extremely efficient at trapping sediments and filtering nutrients like nitrates and phosphates um, from runoff. So in urban areas, um, having a healthy riparian zone can really help with your water quality because it filters um, some of the nitrates and phosphates that might be in the runoff um, or in an, in an agricultural system as well. Um, having a healthy riparian system can really be helpful for the water quality. Um, it's marked by diverse and dynamic habitats that support native biodiversity. So again, this is the area along the margin of the river. It's subject to floods and then drying. There's all this stuff that's happening in the river, energy that's, that's um, you know, moving things around, um, scouring sandbars, that kind of thing. So there's a whole mosaic of different kinds of habitats that are being formed and, and disturbed and then formed again. Um, so it's a very diverse and, and dynamic area. Um, and then there's uh, a lot of work that shows that these riparian corridors are, um, they may represent a very small percentage of a watershed in terms of area, but more than 90% and in some cases 98% of the biogeochemical processing, the breaking down of organic matter is occurring um, in those areas. So really important. Um, and finally, it's this idea of flood attenuation. So they're not just um, filtering uh, runoff that's coming from uh, land use along the sides of the river, but they're actually protecting um, that land also from flooding because if you have a healthy riparian area, it can help attenuate or mitigate some of the impacts of flooding. So really important to have a healthy system like that. This is something I really am always fascinate, fascinated by, um, but this idea of refugia. And what this is, is just habitat that organisms may retreat to or persist in and potentially expand from under changing environmental conditions. Um, this is a, a photo of the Amargosa River in California. It's just outside Death Valley National Park. So it gets less than four inches of rain a year. And yet here is a river that has perennial flow and has um, some really amazing um, vegetation growing along it. It has all kinds of different little critters living in that area too. But the reason it's there is it's fed by a very large uh, regional groundwater system that where the snow is occurring way up high in the mountains, uh, recharging and flowing under the ground and coming out um, along springs along this river. So really important. Um, to have areas like this that um, it may be very isolated um, and maybe things are not going to move out of an area like this, but it still provides um, tremendous diversity for an area that would otherwise be very dry. So the other uh, way of looking at refugia is it may um, provide, be habitat that provides biotic communities with spatial and or temporal resistance to natural or anthropogenic disturbances. So I mentioned the idea of groundwater, um, groundwater coming up in a stream bed, and it's a little bit cooler, so fish can hang out there when it's really cold. That could, in a way, be thought of as refugia. And what we're finding is that <clears throat> with the whole idea of, of climate change, um, headwater streams um, in some of our mountains, um, where these areas are um, protected, they are providing habitat for fish. Um, and providing areas for fish to um, live and, and um, continue to thrive um, uh, because of the environmental conditions associated with them. So whether it's groundwater upwelling 
or a north slope that tends to be cooler than a south slope, those kinds of things can also be um, sort of refugia that, that provide a, a place for um, uh, communities or, or species to, to hang out um, when conditions aren't great. Um, but so protected areas like parks um, or wild and scenic rivers um, and wildlife refuges or forests can be population strongholds um, and function as refugia for um, different critters. And so this last final thing that I wanted to talk about is this idea of resilience. Um, and this is something we're hearing more and more. Um, often it's associated with um, coastal areas and, and storms, um, but it really applies to, to area, all, all areas of our um, environment. Um, so it's the idea that uh, the it's the idea of, of ecosystems being able to absorb or mitigate and respond to disturbance in a way that maintains essentially the same form and function. So it can still do the same things and, and support the same species, um, even though there may be um, some disturbances that are, occur are occurring. Um, but in simple terms, it's the ability to thrive under change, and so. Um, a river that has uh, connectivity, that has a free-flowing condition, that ha it has that complex um, uh, spatial complexity or, or uh, geomorphic complexity, um, that improves a river's capacity to adjust and recover um, fl following floods and fires. Um, another example I, I um, have been using recently uh, is, you know, there were these uh, horrible flat fires along the um, Poudre River um, in Colorado uh, several, over the last several years. Um, and this is an area that, um, where it's my watershed, it's where I live. But anyway, so those fires, um, you know, they, they were really hot fires. They, they burned over really large areas, really destructive. And after those fires came these floods. And the floods uh, washed a lot of sediment um, into the rivers, into a lot of this, mostly into the smaller, you know, tributaries and that kind of thing, but into the main stem as well. But what we are, what we are seeing on that river is some really amazing um, recovery. And it has to do with the idea that because the river is free flowing for the most part, um, it's able to move that sediment out. And it has moved a lot of, right after the fire, you would see, you know, several inches of, um, silt and, and ash, um, ash in the silt and, and mud along the sides of the river, and it's, it was gone within a few years. So partly because we had some really big floods, but they were able to move some of that sediment out. So just the idea that when we have some of those functions still going on in a river, it really does uh, give it some resilience to these things that happen. The other thing about um, hydrologic connectivity river complexity, all of that stuff, is that species may be able to move back into a disturbed area and re recolonize more quickly um, than in an, an area that's fragmented with dams or whatever it might be. So um, they can hang out in their little refugia for a while and then um, hopefully come back. And, and um, on the Poudre River, that's, that is what happened. So, um, so yeah, just this idea of um, resilience and being able to um, recover from uh, disturbance or change. So I wanted to highlight four different rivers in four different parts of the U.S. Um, and these are all wild and scenic rivers. Uh, but we have um, the Middle Fork of the Salmon in Idaho. We have the um, Verde River in the uh, canyons of Arizona. We have the Wakaiva River in the subtropics of Florida. And we have uh, the uh, Farmington, Lower Farmington and Salmon Brook. It's, it's um, the main tributary to the Lower Farmington River um, in, in uh, the woodlands of Connecticut. So four very different parts of the, of the country, um, four very different uh, rivers. So let's look at them a little bit. The Middle Fork of the Salmon contains, this is um, a river that's about 104 miles long, I think. Um, so a fairly long uh, section of river, and the entire segment is protected. So from its source um, down to where it um, uh, flows into the Salmon uh, River, it is, um, it's protected. It's in, it's in Forest Service land. Um, it contains high quality, diverse functioning aquatic habitats 
that provide strongholds for 15 native fishes, um, including one of the best remaining populations of Chinook salmon. Um, it supports a host of other federally listed and recently delisted species, um, including peregrine falcon, bald eagle, and gray wolf, and some sensitive native um, plant species as well. And just a point about those, those um, Chinook salmon that, that are, are found in this area, um, most Chinook salmon in the Middle Fork, in fact, I think like 98% or something like that, there's not a lot of them, but the ones that are there are wild, they're not from hatcheries, and they retain this high genetic diversity, which is key to resiliency and key to the long-term survival of the species. So these fish um, in Idaho have to navigate. Um, they start in Idaho up high in the mountains. They have to uh, swim down um, the salmon to the Snake River and into the Columbia River to, and out to the ocean where they spend a couple years and then turn around and come back. And when they come back, they have to ne negotiate eight of those huge dams. So those little fish are um, pretty remarkable. We have to, um, I think, acknowledge that. But um, what, what we're finding is that um, without that protected area way up high, we, we wouldn't still have these fish here. Even though things aren't great for them along that entire corridor, that, um, that area up high in the mountains is um, essential to their continuing survival. So really, really important um, for those fish. And I will just mention there's talk of removing some of those dams, so that's pretty interesting. Um, Wakaiva, Wild and Scenic River in Florida, um, totally different part of the world. Um, it's one of the few remaining near pristine rivers in Florida, and um, it's a pretty neat space. Um, supports extensive floodplains with significant spring-fed components. So you may be familiar with some of the karst um, systems in, in Florida, which is basically like limestone, and there's these springs that come up through that karst um, that support uh, parts of the river um, and, and um, different habitat. But wildlife is abundant, um, including protected and iconic spe species such as the manatee, which I love, um, Florida black bear, this lovely wood stork, um, bald eagle, and sandhill crane are all found along this area. Um, and then I think one of the important things about this river, at least in, in my opinion, um, is this idea that um, this river corridor, it's about 60 miles, is, um, is protected, there's no federal land. It's protected, it's all um, state and locally owned conservation lands. And so it's a group of local communities that have gotten together um, and working with a partner, which was the National Park Service, they've been able to protect this corridor that provides all of this habitat um, for, for different species. The Lower Farmington uh, Wild and Scenic River in Connecticut supports 19 state-listed plant species, at least 30 species of finfish, which are um, trout-like trout. Um, the corridor supports migratory fish, including American shad, blueback herring, alewife, um, American eel, and Atlantic salmon. All of those fish are fish that um, spend part of their life in, in the ocean um, and then come back. Um, it also supports 12 native, all 12 native southern New England freshwater mussels. Um, and these are not like uh, zebra mussels or quagga mussels that we may read about and clog up um, pipes and are really a nuisance um, and cover actually lake beds and that kind of thing. Um, these are different. Uh, they're native. Um, they're not as prolific as um, those other mussels. Um, and they really provide a, an important um, service to us by um, filtering out large quantities of algae and um, bacteria and silt and those other kinds of things. So um, we have one of the um, strongest or, or um, uh, best communities of um, dwarf wedge mussel on, on this river. So um, really important for that. And finally, Verde, the Verde Wild and Scenic River in Arizona. Um, it's literally an oasis in the desert. It has outstanding habitat that supports 10 native warm water fish, including Colorado pike minnow, Razorback sucker and the Gila top minnow, which are, they're all endangered. Um, it hosts more than 200 bird species, 90 mammal species and 70 native reptile and amphibian species. So again, um, this corridor is um, 
you know, really important to protecting a lot of different kinds of species um, because of uh, some of the processes and functions that are going on in the river. It is one of the last remaining Fremont, Fremont Cottonwood and Gooding, Gooding Willow Gallery forests. Um, these are mature, mature um, forests of, of cottonwood and willow trees. Um, but it, it provides a lot of habitat uh, for all of these different species by, by having the processes that can support um, those trees. So what is the role of wild and scenic rivers in conservation? Um, you know, how well did we do? Remember what Lyndon B. Johnson said, that um, we're setting aside these rivers for, for vital conservation purposes? Well, they provide um, hydrologic connections, sediment transport, and nutrient fluxes that we know are important for um, ecological values. They support river complexity and diverse habitats. Um, also, we know that designation um, requires application of the highest water quality standards, so that's certainly something that is contributing to um, conservation as well as the ecological values of, of um, the, the uh, critters that are living along the river. And, and also the ORVs, um, which include these sensitive aquatic species, including fish, mussels, and plants. So wild and scenic rivers are places that are protecting all of these things. So they are wonderful, but they're not perfect. And there are some limitations of wild and scenic rivers. Um, one of the things that is you know, challenging is that a river, uh, when it's designated, it's a finite segment. So it doesn't usually protect the entire upstream and downstream parts of the river. Um, and so you know, there's things that you have to deal with and manage that, um, that you may not have a lot of control over when, when you're working on these rivers. But, um, but where they are found, um, what we know is that wild and scenic rivers, as well as these other protected areas, there is evidence that they are really truly supporting um, diversity and abundance of native populations at higher rates than you would find outside of these protected areas. Um, conservation of riverine ecosystems requires a combination of protected areas um, restoration efforts. So we're not just protecting um, areas that we want to keep pristine, but we also want to work to restore some of these functions and processes um, in rivers or, or other um, ecosystems where we can. And some of the um, characteristics of a healthy or wild river um, we can use um, in our restoration efforts on, on other rivers. So that's um, something to think about. Um, but to protect these rivers, we also need to think about in-stream flow provisions, um, you know, water rights is a tough thing. Um, but the important point is that you don't need all of the water in the river. There are ways of um, ensuring that there's those functional flows that you need for different species, um, as well as being able to have water for other uses. Um, but you really do need to have some way of ensuring that there's flow in the river, because um, without that, there isn't a river. Um, and so finally, land use policies also are really important in protecting rivers. So it's not just the water, it's not just the, the river itself, but what's going on outside of the river corridor. And so finally, um, and this is something that I uh, found when I was working for the National Park Service, um, working with a group of um, rivers that we call these partnership rivers like the Wakaiva, where there's no federal um, uh, lands there's no federal presence on the river, but the, the federal agency provides um, technical and, and financial assistance. Um, but what we see is that when there are partnerships um, between federal, whether it's federal and local, um, between states and local um, communities, those are the strongest and most robust um, protections, I think, that a, that a river can have. So we really want to have um, these different communities, different agencies, different groups coming together and, and agreeing on um, a future for, for a particular river or, or river segment. Um, and so that's, that's all I have. So thank you. So any questions? We have a few minutes for Q&A. I will be bringing this mic around because it connects the audio to the live feed. So if you raise your hand with a question, I'll just come bring you the mic and then you can speak into it and 
Jennifer will answer. <laughs> Thank you for an interesting uh, presentation. Um, I have the feeling that we're mostly directed towards the crystal at this point. Uh, at least that's what I seem to have read. And I, my question is, what recreational activities are allowed, if any, on wild and scenic rivers, such as rafting, fly fishing, etc. Yeah. So um, it all has to do with uh, what your outstandingly remarkable values are for the river. If you want recreation to be an outstandingly remarkable value, you can describe all of the parts or, or um, opportunities for recreation that you want to see on that river. So, um, so for example, uh, the Cache La Poudre River um, has an ORV of recreation. And, and that ORV actually includes not just boating, but fishing. And so by having both of those um, uh, activities described in the ORV, the management focus is on supporting um, both of those things. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. What's really the process um, for getting a river designated as a wild and scenic river? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different ways it happens, um, but the, the best way is when a local community decides that's what they want, and they sort of elevate it, whether they have a congressperson that's advocating for them. Um, but, but those are really the best way that that, that, that might happen. Um, there's, when we talk about designation, there's um, essentially, they, they say there's, there's two, there's really three different ways it happens. Um, states can actually designate rivers. Um, and we call these um, 2A, 2I rivers. It's based on the section in the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act that, that um, allows them to do that. But so a state can propose a river for designation. There's some criteria they have to meet to do that. Um, the, the most common way that a, a river is designated um, has to do with, again, this idea of a, a group, uh, whether it's a tribe, a community, um, or, or some sort of uh, coalition uh, advocates for uh, designation, um, gets a, uh, someone in Congress to sponsor a bill to do a study of a river and uh, determine whether it's eligible. And then um, once that uh, eligibility study is done, if the river is found eligible, then there can be this recommendation um, to, to designate. Uh, the other way, and the way that what's happening on the crystal, um, the way that I, I think more recently we're seeing this, uh, federal agencies are now required to evaluate, they've always been required, but it wasn't, um, there wasn't as a heavy a push uh, to do it in the past, but um, federal agencies, all, all four federal agencies, and even um, non-land uh, management agencies, like the Army Corps of Engineers, are supposed to evaluate rivers for their eligibility for designation before they um, do anything else on the river. So, um, so when, a, when the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management um, puts forth a new land management plan or a forest plan, um, in the Park Service it was a little bit different. But anyway, when you put forth a, a management plan like that, you are supposed to consider um, a river's uh, eligibility. And so what that does, it sort of takes out one of the steps um, where a community doesn't have to get Congress to um, authorize a study, but the land management agency is actually auth has to do the study. So, um, so a little bit different ways that happens. Um, but again, even when a federal agency uh, finds a river eligible and suitable for designation, then there's this, um, in, in any of these ways that a river gets designated, there, is, there has to be um, outreach and public comment and all of that kind of, kind of stuff. So um, it's complicated and um, it's not easy. Um, but yeah, there are these different ways of, of, uh, for it to happen. Does that help you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good.
Thank you. Um, just a question about, does it, does it have to be, is it defined just to rivers? Can streams qualify? Can creeks qualify? <laughs> In fact, um, there's no minimum length, really. Um, in the first, I think, 15 years or so, there was a minimum length, and then they changed that. But the, the shortest segment that, I, that I'm aware of is, a, is uh, less than half a mile. It's like four-tenths of a mile. Um, it's an un underground river. It's actually in a cave. So, um, so yeah, they can be very short. Um, they can be small segments. Um, I think for the most part, depending on what your... ORVs are, you might need a longer segment to protect that value. Um, but certainly there are uh, cultural features that we might want to um, have as an ORV, and perhaps they don't need a huge um, length of river to, to be able to protect that, um, that cultural value or, or something like that. So there's no minimum um, length, there's no minimum flow or, or anything like that, although they do have to have flow. Um, there, I don't think there are any ephemeral rivers um, in, in the wild and scenic river system. The Amargosa that I um, uh, showed earlier um, does have these perennial streams or perennial segments, but there are segments of that river that are not designated that um, don't have flow all, all year. But, um, but so anyway, yeah, um, you can have some very small, some small segments. Um, the other thing is that we're starting to see this idea of headwater streams being protected. Um, and so certainly a lot of those are very small, um, but uh, there are places where, where that has happened, where um, some small, usually they're uh, connected, not just one little one, but a, a group of connected ones that are um, trying to be, people are trying to protect those. So, yeah, sure. Thank you for the presentation. Um, does it disqualify a river if it is downstream from a dam and its flow is regulated? You would think so. <laughs> so let me give you an example. The Rio Chama in New Mexico, not so far from here, um, is right below a fairly big dam. In fact, I think the designation starts one foot below the dam, literally. Um, the flows are regulated. Um, it was a river that was designated very early on. Um, it's managed by the Bureau of Land Management. I really don't know the history of how it came about that it, that it was designated. And frankly, it provides habitat um, for um, some different species that are uh, otherwise, uh, they're endemic. They, wouldn't, uh, they don't occur anywhere else. So it does have some value to, um, uh, and what uh, you hear, the people that live in that area say is that, yes, we understand that, um, that the flows are regulated, essentially, um, but uh, they are supporting these different uh, values. Um, so, so I don't think they, there are any um, fish values. There, there may be recreation on that river. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But, um, but if there are fish values, it's probably um, introduced species or, or um, you know, sport fishing or that kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, no, so we do have some rivers that are right below dams. The, the uh, Rio Chama, I think, is a pretty unique situation where the, the flow is, in, you know, so regulated. Um, but there are, are some uh, rivers like that, yeah. So somehow. <laughs> Sure. Awesome. Um, I, you worked for the Park Service, and everybody says, oh, America's greatest or best idea was the National Park. Yeah, are there uh, wild and scenic rivers designated in other countries as well? Do you know of that? And maybe some examples. And I think the, the, is it the Dolores River in Colorado is also below a dam, and maybe that's wild and scenic, but I don't know. I just thought I'd ask. Not designated, yeah, no, no. Um, but so only the Cachalapooter in Colorado is currently designated. Um, your question about uh, whether there are other countries that have this system, no. But um, there's actually a lot of interest in, uh, mostly that I'm familiar with, um, European countries. And they've come to, um, come to us and asked us about, uh, well, when, when I was still working, 
um, asked us about how how we were how we did it and um, and what were the benefits. Um, a, a lot of the European countries have um, hydropower, at, you know, existing hydropower. It's a, a large source of energy um, for them, but they still want to protect certain segments of rivers. And so, um, I think it's the World Wildlife Fund is really working with um, uh, communities in, in Europe, um, different organizations, to try to um, establish some sort of uh, similar. Uh, protections um, in some ways. Um, there's also some efforts in different countries to give rivers uh, rights, um, and I don't really know a lot about that, quite honestly. But there, but there are these other efforts that are going on. I think what's happening in in these European countries might be um, the best, uh, 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 si most similar efforts that that um, that are happening. So yeah. I call the Wild and Scenic River System America's second best idea. So, <laughs> so yeah. All right, um, that's our time. Let's all give. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone is feeling inspired, Wilderness Workshop has provided a petition um, that you can sign and help support their work in giving the Crystal River that wild and scenic designation. Um, and that's just on the table on your way out. Thank you all so much for coming, and please join us in two weeks for our next Naturalist Night speaker.